Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got Tiffany Bova with us today, and we're going to be talking about remote selling through an economic crisis. Welcome to the show, Tiffany. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Tiffany is the growth and innovation evangelist at Salesforce and the author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Growth IQ, Get Smarter About the Choices That Will Make or Break Your Business. Tiffany is a top influencer in customer experience, digital transformation, the future of work, and sales. And she was recently recognized as one of Inc. Magazine's 37 sales experts you need to follow on Twitter. She's also a LinkedIn top sales expert to follow in 2018 and 2019, and a top 100 woman in tech. Uh, really excited to get your uh, thoughts on, on uh, this discussion today about remote selling through economic crises, Tiffany. Um, let's jump into it. First question, uh, how can field salespeople keep deals moving when they can't see speak to or easily connect with the prospects that they're used to being able to meet with face to face? Well, I always like to start the answer to any question that starts with what should field sellers do is <laughs> that field sellers now have been completely upended. You know, many field sellers have only been selling face to face either for their entire career or they graduated from selling inside to selling outside and it was sort of a badge of honor of the way that they established relationships with customers was that face-to-face -face handshake or a round of golf or a dinner or at a trade show uh, or just meeting with executives face-to-face. -face. And so having to be able to continue those kinds of relationship building activities remotely has been a shift for them, right? Changing the way in which they reach out, they engage and, and how they add value at each step. And so that was a big adjustment. So I think the first thing to realize if you're a sales leader or a sales manager listening to this is you've got some work to do, not to reskill and retrain necessarily, right? Because they're solid sellers, but it's more about the soft skills that they maybe are no longer use as frequently, maybe as inside sellers do, i.e. the phone or voicemail or an email or now video. So I think the first thing I'd say is getting deals to continue to not go away completely is one challenge, but keeping them moving forward during this time requires all different kinds of engagement. It's multi-touch uh, across email, which still remains one of the top communication channels. In other words, like, ah, oh, email's dead. It's far from dead. And, and now more than ever, people are communicating more that way. So. So I'd answer that uh, with starting from making sure your outside sellers have everything they need and they're enabled to be successful now selling differently. Selling from home, not you know behind the wheel of a car, on the phone, pulled over on the side of the road, preparing for a meeting. So that, that's where I'd start answering that question. Excellent. And what, uh, what do you think sellers usually need that's different when they're selling from home um, that they might not have had access to before? What types of resources, what types of uh, products, what, what, what would they need? So I, I say this, look, you know, as I call myself a recovering seller, I sold for many, many years. I sold technology for almost 15, uh, but I haven't been a quota bearing sales rep for about that long uh, as well. So, I, you know, but I missed the fight and missed the hunt. So this is my way of staying close to what sales does is sort of learn and listen and talk to lots of sellers. And so what, what I'd say here is that this is about the, the one thing I believe sellers can control. Look, we can't control the territories we sell into, the products we sell, the comp plan, you know, what we do every day, what tools we use in most cases, you know, are delivered to us by the company we work for. But the one thing we can control is how we behave in front of a customer and how they feel when they engage with us. And so that's an area that I think uh, is one that needs attention at this moment because it requires more kind of EQ, right? The emotional side of selling, not the skill side of selling, right? You know, how to uncover a lead and get a deal moving forward. 
It has a lot now to do with the tone that you use in responding to customers' demands. You know, being empathetic to what they're going through as a customer, not just about forwarding your deal through the pipeline, right, or the sales process, but more thinking about, hold on, you know, what value can I add from a business perspective today? You know, maybe I'm just asking, how are they doing? And that's the end of my connection to them, right? That it isn't, hey, here's a new product. Here's something I want to talk to you. I don't want this deal to, you know, lag. I, I want to keep talking me, 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 I, 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 my, my, my products. Uh, this has to really flip. So I'd say outside of tools um, and systems, you know, I, I like to try to hone in on the one thing we can control. It's kind of how we show up how prepared we are, and also the position we take in that conversation we're having with customers. Outstanding. And what about um, gaining, gaining people's attention, getting their interest when you're remote? What, what tips do you have for field sellers who maybe are used to the ability to knock on a door or uh, you know, do something a little more proactive? How, how do you maybe meet people at a conference? How would you gain people's attention today? What, what tips do you have? So most sellers are extroverts, although introverts are very successful sellers as well, as well in a very different way. But this is an opportunity uh, where I see sellers actually becoming uncomfortable again about what they do every day. You know, salespeople need to be confident and feel, you know, secure in what and believe in what they're selling and how they're selling it. And obviously, uh, you know, connecting with customers in this, in that way. But now it's a matter of, getting a little uncomfortable and doing things that may not be normal or natural in the selling process. So as you just said, right, knocking on a door, well, maybe how do you do a door knock quick visit in a video? How do you do it with a voice recorded message in LinkedIn instead of just a in mail? How do you do it with a video, maybe through a direct message uh, on a social platform? Maybe it's, you know, something like that where your door opener or your touch is unique enough that you stand out from the crowd. It can't just be, you know, longer emails with more and more content, right? You, you need to start to think about how can I become remarkable, uh, to use my friend Seth, Seth Godin's term, right? How do you become remarkable where they go, gosh, you know, I heard from 10 salespeople today, but today Tiffany really nailed it, right? She, she gave me something that I remember and I talked about, wow, this person reached out to me and it was a little video. It was something showing me how to you know do something or it was a copy of an article that they read that made made them think about me and it was actually really valuable they were listening to what i had said to them the last time we met they remembered they followed up and sent me something that had value that stands out and while that sounds really basic you know i can tell you that i'm just going to pick on linkedin for a second i get hundreds of emails the ones that stand out are the ones that are unique and different, right? That add value. And they took a moment to look at my profile, you know, versus saying, are you looking for leads? We can help you find leads. And I go, well, if they'd spent one minute on my profile, they probably realize I don't need leads because I'm not in selling in that way anymore. And so what that did to me was it said, you spent, you didn't care enough to spend the 30 seconds to look at who I was. You just blasted some in mail because you're checking a box on your productivity metrics. And that will turn people off quicker than anything else, because then when you do show up, they're going to go, I remember that person, you know, didn't care enough before, and they may never open your in-mail again. So, you know, you have this opportunity to um, try things. Now, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be strange. You may completely be terrible at it the first couple of times, but that's okay. It's genuine. It's authentic. Everyone's a little uncomfortable with the new medium we're all being forced to work in. Uh, and, and within, you know, so I, I think it's a, this is a great opportunity to give it a try. Uh, you said something so important there that I wanted to hear more thoughts from you on the, how the genuine, authentic connection with customers. I think that's such a challenge for outside salespeople right now. Um, what thoughts do you have on, on how salespeople can create that genuine, authentic connection with their customers without being able to have an in-person meeting without being able to take them out for a coffee or a drink or a, or a, or a dinner. How do you, how can you accomplish that over the phone? So I, I can only use myself as an example. Look, you know, I, last year I flew 375,000 miles. I gave a hundred keynotes and six on six continents. You know, I I'm on the road quite a bit now. I'm obviously not, um, I'm on the road this way. So, you know, I'm coming to you today from Los Angeles, California, but you know, at the end of the day, I have these, really meaningful connections with people around the world and some I've never met. 
you know, we have really good exchanges on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, they support my work. I support their work. We learn from each other, but we've never met. And so, it, you know, it's a matter of spending that time and, you know, learning something about them. And so for a seller's perspective, we have a, a stat at Salesforce that we got from State of Sales last year. Uh, we have a new one coming out in a couple of weeks, but that showed that 66% or so of a seller's time is spent on non-selling activities. You know, it could be preparing for a meeting and all those things. And so, you know, part of using technology um, in order to give you the insights you need to show up with those more personalized connections that are more authentic, it has to be able to capture the information you've gathered in all those face-to-face -face meetings. So that the next best action is guided by what you've already done and it's triggering you to say, hey, like the example I just gave, they were talking to you about something that was very interest they were interested in, but it was maybe a year or two out. Let's say it was virtual reality. I'm using that as an example. Uh, and now you found this really great article where you can go, you know, who talked to me about virtual reality? Go and search that and then send them out that article. And right now, for an example, like real estate, if you can't do face-to-face -face showing, virtual reality is the way to go. And real estate is booming right now. And so ultimately, those realtors have had to find a way that are normally open house, face-to-face -face showing, driving someone around the neighborhood. All of that is mostly happening virtually today, depending on where you are in the world from a selling perspective, right? Some realtors are actually having open houses. Others are not and doing it in a virtual way. And so it's about making sure you can capture that. Now, if you have a handful of customers, you can do it here. If you have 100, 1,000, 5,000 customers that you're responsible for managing as a sales development rep or an account-based marketer or a business development manager, there's no way you can do it at scale without technology. So, you know, it's not lost on me. I work at Salesforce, but at the end of the day, you have to use something. Otherwise, that personalized connection is up here uh, and that's where you get beat by sales reps who actually make and are not afraid of the investment in technology in order to help them be more authentic and personalized um, and showing up with insights that your customers feel are really, really valuable to them, not to you, but to them. And, and what about the, the messaging and the tone of the messaging? How can salespeople, how should salespeople adjust their tone and their messaging uh, to their customers during these times? Yeah, this is a big one. Uh, and I use an example of kind of the first three or four weeks of the lockdown. All of a sudden, you know, we started hearing, I'm sure like, like myself, you started hearing from all these brands via email. I'm here for you. We're here for you. How can we help you? And you're like, geez, I don't even remember doing business with that brand. When was it? Who is this? How'd they get my information? Bought some list. I signed up for something, you know, five years ago, or they were, i was a client of theirs five years ago, and I haven't heard from them since the last time I bought. Now, all of a sudden, they care about my well-being. The other side of that is uh, life insurance. All of a sudden, I started getting a lot of life insurance emails, and I was like, well, I'm not saying that's a bad message. I'm just thinking maybe that's not the right message in a pandemic in the first couple of weeks when everyone's really nervous. And so it could have been during these difficult times, you know, whatever, the empathetic opening message that look we're here from you if you have questions about your existing policy or if you don't have one where you're showing some compassion you're just not going hey if you're over this age you need life insurance so not only have you made me feel bad that i'm old but secondarily that i need life insurance right and so at the end of the day that tone of messaging is as a seller now i'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the life insurance company maybe that marketing campaign was set up before the pandemic and no one thought to go back in the first couple of weeks because everyone was home and we were in this sort of very chaotic uh, few first few weeks. And so I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt because I haven't heard back from them since on that message. So let's think it was already scheduled. But even something like that, that it was scheduled to send something out, you've got to make sure that you go back and, and make sure that the tone and the message is accurate for today's time. Many people are unemployed. Many sellers are unemployed, but many customers, many small businesses have not opened back up. You know, if it's a res restaurant or hospitality business that you're selling into, really, really difficult. And so, you know, how can you help them? And so I think it's a matter of asking, but more importantly, you know, sellers have to become master askers, but then they have to listen. 
And for salespeople who like to talk and sort of convince people of what they need to buy and what they need to do, uh, you know, listening is, is really a skill going back to what are the things they need to work on. But from tone and me messaging, it's kind of, you know, making sure that whatever it is you're selling and how you're selling it sort of fits the context of the market today. You know, there's a lot of uneasiness. We're coming up on an election in the United States. Um, we've got a lot going on even beyond the pandemic in social justice and inequality. So you have to make sure you're not ignoring it, but if you're gonna fully pivot into it, then it really needs to be authentic going back to your previous uh, you know, comment, especially if your brand's culture does not align to those things and you're out there trying to tout it, there's a disconnect between the two uh, and, and it may turn prospective buyers or customers off. Absolutely, and, and there's so much going on right now. I mean, I think everyone's heads are spinning to some degree. What, what recommendations would you have around helping a salesperson up start a conversation in an empathetic and appropriate way with a, a new prospect or customer. Like you, you mentioned feeling, you know, a little on your heels when the life insurance company reached directly out to you. But what for a, for a seller who, who's trying to build pipeline and, 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 uh, and maybe they're struggling with the, with the end of their pipeline and maybe their middle pipeline is, you know, the, how do, is also struggling. And they're, so they're focusing on their prospecting so they can think about, you know, maybe doing well in the next year, even if the next quarter is not going to be great. Um, how can they, how can they get their tone right and, and start, the, start that conversation, get that awareness with customers? What, what do you recommend? So I'd say this, you know, this is not a hard, fast rule, but one that I've been saying over the last couple months, it is, I believe this is the year of the customer and not necessarily the prospect. And what I mean by that is many sellers are enamored by the next logo they're going to go get. You know, the shiny new customer that they've been trying and trying to sell to for a really long time. They may even be being directed to do that by marketing, right? Here's the campaign, here's the call list, go get, go forth and win. Here's the list of new customers we want you to go for. But what that ignores is the existing customers you already have. You've spent a lot of money and time and effort in acquiring them in the first place. And so many sellers actually ignore the gold they already have, uh, what I like to say. And I covered this in a chapter in my book, Growth IQ, customer-based penetration was all about going in into the gold you already have. So an example would be, you know, I'm in the West, right? I'm in Los Angeles. When they were hunting for gold and, and mining for gold in the beginning, they did not find gold in the mountain and go, oh my goodness, this is so fantastic. Let's go find another mountain. What they did was they sat there, they put their fence around and said, this is my mountain. I'm going to mine it till there's nothing left. And then I'm going to go find another mountain. But from a selling perspective, it's like we're always looking for the new mountain. And we just let that customer sort of flounder by the wayside, either not getting helped on how to use the product, increase recency of purchase, share of wallet, average basket size, whichever industry you're in. Unless you're doing something like home sales, where that's one, you know, almost a once in a lifetime biggest asset acquisition they're going to do, may not buy another house for 10, 20, 30 years. In certain situations, that doesn't work, but it could work for referrals. It could work for how can you, you know, have them help you uh, get your name out there. Now, so to go back to your question, um, I think that's where we fall down. So, you know, I, I use cellular service as an example. If you've seen a cellular commercial and I'm, I'm being exaggerative on purpose for drama in this example, but you know, if you sign up with us, you get five free Apple 98 X phones. We you know we'll come by, set it up. You get 3 trillion gigs of data. We'll rub your feet. We'll send you on vacation, you know, and we'll tell you you're pretty and cook you dinner. And you're like, I want that. So you call the cell phone service and they're like, Oh no, that's for new customers. You've been with us for 10 years and your average revenue is you know, $500 a month. And we don't actually, this isn't for you. This is for everybody we don't have. So what does that tell your existing customers? I don't care very much about you, right? You're, you're not year after year saying we value enough. We're going to add more, um, in, you know, we're either going to add more value to your contract. We may lower the price. We may throw in some free things because you've got our entire portfolio. Like we're going to give you something back for your continued loyalty and, and uh, willingness to work with us. Uh, and that's what I mean by selling into the customer versus going and trying to chase the, you know, chase net new. Because if you think of someone who has 
a thousand customers, 5,000, 10,000, you know, and you knew who they were during this pandemic, you're in a much better situation than if you had five or 10,000 customers and you didn't know who they were. For example, a restaurant might be full, might be Michelin star, but you don't know who any of those people that dine at your restaurant have been for the last five years. So now that you're doing takeout, maybe delivery with Uber Eats or Grubhub, and you wanna send out a message to say, hey, you could still have your favorite dinner. We know you come here every three weeks. We well, can't do that, why? You don't know who they are. Going back to what we were saying before, of really using that technology. And so many businesses have been, gotten caught flat footed because they weren't able to sell into the existing base because they had no idea who they were. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense to me. And um, do you, so I, I guess you're saying that, that it's more important to focus on mining your existing customer base than finding new customers right now because it's so hard. What if, what if you do need to go after new revenue and, uh, and, and you, are, so you are having a decent balance there, but uh, in terms of getting new revenue, would you recommend focusing on new pipeline or focusing on closing the existing pipeline that you already have? So once again, you know, the challenge here is that if an individual seller is listening to this, they go, I totally agree with what you're saying, Tiffany, but I'm told every day that to call this list of 100 prospects. I, I'm not actually responsible for selling into the base, right? And so they're trapped between what they think would help them retire a quota versus what they're being asked to do from a management perspective. So it's not lost on me that I realize that we only have so much control. Going back to one of my earlier comments, right? I mean, we can't really control um, what they're asked to do with us unless in these times your sales leaders are saying, we need to find business, we need you to retire quota, whether it's into the base or net new. But let me answer your question. From a net new perspective, I'm gonna go back to knowing who your customers are. When you have reached out to customers, what has worked in the past? You know, customers who, uh, you know, your most valuable, profitable, have the highest recency, highest average sale price or basket size, who are they? How do you go find more of them? What was the lead source of that particular constituency of customers that seems to be performing better than any others? That's where you should go. So it's kind of what I said, right? I'm not meaning that you only sell into your base and forget prospecting. I think if you're going to prospect, you have to become much smarter about prospecting because you want your sellers, you want individually to actually close some business. But forecast and pipeline, pipeline right now is really lumpy. And that's not something we can control because some, some industries and some regions and some states and some zip codes and towns are shutting down and opening back up and shutting down and opening back up. There's a lot of uncertainty. But if you are smarter about the existing base that you have, even as an individual seller, what has worked, what lead source, that's where I want you to focus your attention. But that sort of you know spray and pray of I'm just gonna call 100 people 10 people might call me back, two will set a meeting, even if it's a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or whatever meeting, you know, then you say two will you know, set these meetings and I'll sell one. So for every hundred, I'm gonna sell one. That math we've used for since the beginning of time. And if you really wanna know how long that sort of metric has been in place, it's since the late 1800s, not the late 1900s, but the late 1800s, it was, uh, it was NCR, the National Cash Register, uh, business and it was the head of sales with a gentleman by the last name of Watson and he left and went on to found IBM but he started that whole call you know go knock on a hundred doors go knock on a hundred businesses five will tell you yes to come in and two will come for a demo and you know all those things we've been doing this from a selling perspective for well over a hundred years so ultimately I'm saying that now with all the value that technology can give us Sure, call 100 people today, but call the 100 that are gonna say 40 are gonna be interested to hear from you, 20 are gonna set up a meeting, and then you're gonna close 10 of it, right? Instead of just saying, you know, 100 to one is, is math I'm willing to do, because then you just start dialing for dollars. Uh, and it's just really tough right now, uh, you know, for everybody, understandably. Absolutely. Um, what would you say some of the common mistakes are that you've seen salespeople making trying to sell now as opposed to uh, before yeah. like, uh, given the new world we're working with here i'd use marshall goldsmith's you know what got kind of what got us here is it going to get us there um because so much has changed over the last six months so depending on where you are in the world listening to this 
uh, you know, habits of consumers and customers, and I say consumer and customer regardless of what you're selling, I mean individual human beings, habits have changed. They normally change at about 65 days, and some will say it'll change at 120 days, but regardless of whether it's 60 or 120, the point is we're long past that. Uh, from a pandemic standpoint, which means our shopping, our buying habits, even in a B2B environment, so not just B2C as consumers and how we buy, you know, we used to buy, you know, 95% of our groceries in the store and we might buy some stuff that we need and we could set up on a regular basis from Amazon, 5% of our groceries. That's totally flipped for many people and a good percentage of them may never go back to the grocery store. That is a habit that will forever change. Look at about working from home or working from anywhere versus working from the office will be very, very different. So you have to think that the behaviors have changed from your customers, your prospects going forward. And a large percentage of them may never change back, which means you cannot approach it the same way you used to because on the other end of that selling motion is a customer with a very different attitude. So looking at it that way and starting from, hold on a second, how have my customers changed? Has their communication style changed? Do I have the right tone? I used to email them every week. Should I mail them every two or three weeks now that I know they're closed down? Should I not email them at all and wait until I know they open back up? That means you're actually starting from the customer and working your way backwards and then saying, how do I adjust my behavior in order to be really effective, empathetic, compassionate, personalized, uh, you know, all the things we've just been saying you have to start from the customer and work back, not start from your sales process and work forward. Yeah, I think it's also really, you know, something that's worth, you know, you kind of jog your thought with me there, that I think people need to rethink who is the best customer for them to be selling to right now. It might be a subset of your existing customer base. It might be someone slightly different as the world has shifted, but we, we we often call this your ICP or your ideal customer profile. And I think that a lot of companies need to kind of rethink who, who they're looking at and, and doing business with. Um, do, you, do you have any other thoughts there? Oh, absolutely. But I'm going to go back to what I keep hammering on. And, and once again, this doesn't have, you know, prior to joining Salesforce, I was a research fellow at Gartner for a decade and my area of coverage was sales transformation. So I have not changed this talk track just because I work at Salesforce. But without the data and the information on your customer, I can't almost even answer that question because I don't know who your existing customers are. I don't know who the most profitable are, the source they are. So I always like to say, start with what you know, layer on top of it, uh, the context of the market, which is really the opening of my book, is you have to understand how have your customers changed? How has the competitive landscape changed? How has your own business changed? You know, what are the things that are going on? And then layer that onto, is my sales motion still relevant? Does it still work? Would it still land the way it used to land? And then what adjustments do I need to make? And so can I pilot, test, and launch something different and new? Once again, going back to, we're gonna have to get a little uncomfortable. Even though we were really comfortable in the way we did it before, it's just not possible. So, you know, I think that unless you have the data, it's almost impossible for you to say what is working, what, what was working, what's working now, and then maybe even scenario, if you really want to get advanced and you're a sales leader, scenario planning, three different scenarios. We get back to selling face-to-face -face in six months, in 12 months, in 18 months. And based on those three scenarios, how would you organize your selling teams? How would you put together forecast and pipeline? How would you set expectation for revenue growth, for churn, for customer growth, whatever it might be? So, you know, sales is a part of a business that does not tend to have the same level of rigor from a financial perspective that other parts of the organization have. So all the things I just tossed out to you has to do, you do scenario plan for products, you scenario plan for financial, you scenario plan for IPO. If you go now six months, 12 months, if you do M&A, scenario planning of what it would look like, if you launch a product, what it will look like. But from a selling perspective, did anyone scenario plan if face-to-face -face selling ever stopped? I doubt it. But now that it has, have you scenario planned how long it will stay this way and what your sales team would look like? So that's the kind of rigor I think has been missing um, in, the, in sort of the art of selling for some time. And even the most 
highly productive, efficient, top performing sales organizations, you will find pockets of that and lots that don't. And so this is just an area I think um, all selling you know, companies of one, two, five, 500, 5,000, 50,000, doesn't matter. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think there's so many things to rethink like this when you, we've had a great economy for a decade, right? And we've almost forgotten that you you really do have to behave very differently in a recession. And we might, we might not have given a lot of things the, the attention they need um, during a recession as we, as we did when, you know, it, it, we've been focusing on how to, be, on what motions we're supposed to go through in a great economy, right? Um, one that jumps out at me is um, that we haven't talked about is churn. How, you know, losing existing customers. So we mentioned the focus on the existing customers, but, you know, how, how can field salespeople address churn right now? So many businesses are just losing a lot of their customer base. Should, should they even be focused on reducing churn right now? Or is the, or, or is the churn that's occurring just hopeless? Or, or is, it, uh, is it a good time to, to zoom in on that? So uh, I covered uh, churn in a whole chapter in my book as well. And I actually flipped the script on it. I actually used it as a offensive measure, not a defensive measure. So I'm just going to use an example. It was back in 2002. I was running a uh, customer. I was running sales service and uh, marketing for a, the largest web hosting company in the U S we were at the time, we were sort of three or four times bigger than Rackspace. Um, and we were 160 million in MRR. Uh, once again, this is 2002 to 2004. And at the end of every month, we would have a spike in churn. And back then hosting was like, even for just a shared web hosting account was 50 bucks. Domain names were like $25. You know, it's a dollar 99 now and four bucks, right? So we've come a long way doing Moore's law, but back then we'd see this spike in churn. And we'd be like, what is going on? And so we didn't have all these amazing tools we have today. It was very much an Excel spreadsheet and an ERP system on the back end. And we learned that it was credit cards expiring that was spiking the churn. And then the customer service agents would have to call out to everybody or email them and say, your credit card expired. Give us your, you know, because we knew if they had email with us, that the phone would ring instantaneously because their email was down and they'd give us an updated credit card. But not always back then was websites as important. You know, people were still doing yellow page ads and doing direct mailers and radio uh, ads and things like that. The, the web was not as it is today um, in so many ways. Uh, and once we realized that, we put together a rule that said 90 days before expiration of the credit card, send out an email and say, your credit card is expiring. And I was one of the beta clients, we were one of the beta clients of Eloqua in Constant Contact. Like, this is how long ago this was. And we were started to use these social selling tools and started using sort of email newsletters and everything in a way that was communicating very focused on churn. I use that example today, almost 20 years later, and I say something that simple to realize what's causing churn and can we get ahead of it in an offensive way then pouring all kinds of money and resources and processes in win back campaigns. Like, let me win them back after I've lost them. Going back to, if you're paying too much attention to net new customers and you forget the gold you already have, you're churning the gold you already have, you have to sell two to one to make up for that. But if you could get them to just not churn in the first place, and now you're adding one, one and one is three. And so if you're in a recurring revenue business, you have the rule of 78s, there's all kinds of value around having that recurring revenue without churning out. And in that business, churn can be a competitive weapon. Uh, and so you see in the new companies, like some, like the OTT providers, like a Netflix or someone like that, they're constantly honed in on what's the churn rate, how do they, original content, getting rid of ads, you know, coming up with certain genres, making deals with other content providers. Netflix is trying to stave off someone leaving them to go somewhere else for content. And so you, if you get ahead of it and understand what would drive people to stay, you don't have to get into that win back, win back uh, motion. And I think that you're know, trying to ask for forgiveness or win someone back puts you at an extreme disadvantage. Plus, it's like then you've got a set of sellers or customer service agents that are constantly calling, trying to win back. And, you know, the level of 
uh, ability to do that or win rate at that point is lower. It's kind of just this thankless slog, right, of trying to get people to come back. So I'm much more of a fan of trying not to lose them in the first place, which means you need to understand what they value uh, and how do you keep them engaged so that they don't go away. Now, at this time, there's so much happening that we almost can't control the churn with the percentage of businesses that are closed and may not open back up, which means you have to understand where is your risk there, play out those scenario plans that are you gonna have a triple, a quadruple of your churn rate continuing over the next three, four, five months, and what can you do to make sure you have enough coming back in the bucket that's leaking out the other end? Um, those, those are some of the, you know, going back to the comment about the rigor in the selling organization, I think it's really important for you to, to look at that side of it as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's so important to get ahead of churn and really try to understand why your customers are leaving and, 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 and headed off at the pass before, before they leave. Um, what, are there any other mindset changes that you think that salespeople could try to undergo to bring to really focus on customer retention and reduce churn? Yeah, I, I use, uh, you know, a tried and true one for me is once again, the individual sales reps only have so much control over what I'm about to say. But the connection point between marketing, sales and customer service even something as small as shifting the name of the customer service organization to customer success and creating uh, metrics and KPIs that are shared amongst all three of those customer facing teams so that everybody's rowing in the same direction. We want to recruit and obtain and acquire the right customer. We want to sell them the right product at the right time. We want to make sure they're enabled and they're successful using whatever it is we've sold them. And then how do we get them to buy again more frequently, more often in a shorter recycle, you know, in a repeat um, cycle. And all of those things require a connection between those three groups. And so as a seller, you know, it might be, Hey, I have an idea, bring it to sales management and saying, how do we shore this up management saying, Hey, how do I get better connected with these other customer facing groups? Because if marketing is saying the sky is blue, and then sales sells them, the sky is orange. And then customer service gets the call that, am I dealing with a different company? Like what happened? Like I thought I bought this and I got that and I wanna churn. And then customer service in that way is kind of taking everything that's rolling downhill. And you know, the, the, the adage I am referring to. And so ultimately it's a matter of, but if everybody understands, look, we're gonna, we're gonna market what we do, we're gonna sell what we can deliver we're going to service in a way that it isn't about just fixing problems, but it's about adding value in, in new and, and incremental ways. Um, the connection between those three, I think is the most powerful connection for decades. We've heard sales and marketing are disconnected and the new power couple and all that, but customer service has always sort of been left out. And so the, the trifecta for me for improving performance in this area whether it's selling to net new customers, selling into the base or reducing churn is when those three groups are very squarely focused on the same thing. Everybody understands how their role impacts customer experience and the success of the customer. And then there is a metric that ties those three groups together that marketing isn't all about leads, sales isn't all about selling and customer service isn't all about churn, right? It has to be everybody is, uh, responsible for all of those things in some way. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the rule of 78. So I'm not sure everyone's familiar with that. Would you, could you tell us about what, what that is? Yeah, sure. So uh, back in the hosting day, you know, if January you acquire one customer and in February that one customer carries over and you add one more customer, now you have three, you know, two, uh, three. And then it's the same thing. Those two carry over, you add one, those three carry over, you add one, the five, ta, da, da, da. if you add that all up, it's 78. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And so if it's a dollar and you acquire one for a dollar, and then at the end of the year, that's worth $78. And so $1, $100, $10,000, $1, 000, $1, $1,000,000, right? That's the rule of 78 is that, you know, you, if you drew it out and literally just put a one and then a one and a one and a one, a one, a one, and a one, a one, a one, right there, you got three, four, five, six mm -hmm. in your third month. So if it's nine ninety nine a month or 10 bucks a month, it would be $60. By the time you get to December, 
you've carried all those ones over and you have 12 in that line, that number is 78. Excellent. Um, what advice would you have for salespeople who want to show customers why they should stay with them? Maybe they're getting pressure from, you know, to, to cut costs. Maybe the, maybe they're, you know, tighten the, tighten the, the belt down. Uh, maybe they're reevaluating which vendors we really need to stick with. Who are we really using right now? What do you tell a salesperson who, or, or a customer success person um, who, who really wants to, show the value and show why a customer should stick with them. You know, this is, this is sort of where I say, you know, value-based selling, insight-based selling is what value is to a customer could be very, very different. Um, I've been talking a lot for many years around the concept of jobs to be done. Um, it's really Clay Christensen's, uh, he, Clayton Christensen wrote Innovator's Dilemma. And uh, unfortunately, he recently passed away, but his, one of his last books was Competing Against Luck. And it was about jobs to be done. And the jobs to be done theory is people do not buy a quarter inch drill bit. They buy a quarter inch hole. But really what they buy is a shelf being hung on the wall. They're not buying the hole and they're not buying the drill bit. They're buying, I want my shelf on the wall. That is the value, not the drill bit, not the hole. So what is the shelf for you in your business? What is the job that your buyer is trying to do? How do you decouple that in a way that your product or service either plays the entire piece of that, like a drill can get the shelf hung on the wall, right? I mean, like you might need a hammer and obviously the shelf, but you get the point. Um, that if you can deconstruct jobs to be done, then you understand what the value levers are. And so you can't get the shelf hung up, the end result, the outcome, uh, what your customer is really trying to, to achieve unless you had a way to put a hole in the wall. And so if you are the drill bit, if you are the drill, if you are the carpenter, if you are the general contractor, if you are any of those, then the message is we can do hanging this shelf better than anybody else. We've got the best support. We can walk you through it. We have how-to videos. We have you know support 24 seven. If something goes wrong, we warranty our work forever, right? But the value is what the customer, the job they're trying to do. So if you look at Uber as an example, Uber was about getting somebody from point A to point B. You could catch a taxi, you could rent a car, you could drive your own car. But what Uber did was they decoupled the job to be done, which is getting from point A to point B and said, when you don't have your car, when you don't have, you know, you're, you don't want to rent a car, you're in another city, you don't want to have to deal with it. And, and you don't want to have to deal with all the hassle of finding a taxi. You want all of these things. We're going to solve that job to be done. So could Uber have become Tesla to try to compete with Tesla? Sure, they could have become an entire car company, but they pulled out one of the jobs to be done. And if you look at Amazon's strategy in the financial services market, they are nipping away at all the jobs to be done within FinServe and banking and retail banking, credit cards, financing. They're just nipping away one at a time. They're not standing up Amazon banks. They're saying, how do we pick jobs to be done and how do we go and add, you know, either make it easier than anything else, add more experience and value, you know, whatever the case might be. So as a seller, you know, that's what you need to understand is whatever you are selling, whatever it is you are doing, what job is it satisfying? And so you can just search jobs to be done, um, you know, anywhere on any search engine on Google, right? Search it. Um, there's all kinds of information, but that's the way I started thinking about when I was sharing these kinds of ideas about how to transform selling was what is the, what is the job that a sales leader is actually trying to get their people to do? What is it? Don't tell me I need them to enter into the CRM system. Like that's definitely not a job salespeople want to do. They do not want to wake up in the morning and go, I can't wait to data enter. Like that's not, they don't dream of that job to be done. But to your question, you know, they want to add value. They want to be authentic. They want to show up with the right information at the right time. Okay. That's the job you want to do. Now, how can technology help you do that? We need data, we need AI, we need intelligence, right? We need machine learning, we need all these things. That's how we get that job done. So being able to ask those questions, going back to what I said a while ago around becoming master asker as a seller, you're listening for what jobs are they trying to get done? Does what you sell 
product or service, satisfy that. If it does individually, fantastic. If it does, if you partner with someone else, fantastic. If it's something you don't do at all, don't sell it to them. Walk away from the deal. Because if not, they'll just end up churning. And so in the end, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the right sale for you anyway. So that was a very, I could spend hours talking about this particular topic, but you know, I think that's a great way when you're thinking about what are, where should I be focused? What's going to work during this time? It's understanding what the job to be done. Like right now, everyone working remote, it, it's probably going to be video. Can I solve any of those problems? I need it to be authentic. Well, then I, I need to make sure my sellers have that information. Should I be buying third-party data to help fill in what we don't know? Those kinds of things, that's where you start thinking and really differentiating yourself. Uh, because for me, growth is a thinking game, full stop. If you can outthink your competition, even if your product is equally as good or a little bit less, but you deliver this really amazing and compelling experience in a new way, you, you, you still have a really great shot at winning, if not always winning. Well, the next section in our show is called Sales in 60 Seconds. And what we do is a quick questions, quick answer section. All so, right. First question, what is the one thing that a lot of salespeople don't do enough of or even neglect, but should focus more on in order to be successful? Listening. Was that short enough? <laughs> That's pretty short. <laughs> awesome. Now, what, what specifically should they listen to or what, what should they be listening for? Well, you know, you have to ask the right questions. And then if you ask the right questions, you'll get insights into those jobs that they're trying to get done. Uh, and then that's how you frame the conversation um, to differentiate yourself or show up with something that's more value-based and insight-driven. Uh, but many salespeople talk more. You know, there's a, there's a tool out there like a gong IO will listen to salespeople and how many questions did they ask versus how many did the customer ask? How much time did they speak versus how much time did the customer speak? And the high performers are much better at asking more questions, listening longer and talking less. So that's what I mean by listening. Excellent. And, and what's your best tip for getting past the gatekeeper while you're selling remote? You just have to show up with something that they find extremely compelling and valuable. And it isn't the example I gave of just send out a blast email and say, I know you're looking for leads. It's like, well, you, well, no, I'm not, you know? So uh, I think it's, it's, you need to be compelling. It needs to be somewhat personalized. You need to have the right tone. And so that comes down to actually showing up with the information that will get you to get that gatekeeper to go, huh, that's different. That's unique. That's valuable. I want to hear more. I want to learn more. I want to see more. Um, and even if it's something like a 30 second video or a voice message, like I said, on a LinkedIn or in, embedded in an email, it's going to stand out. Uh, and so it won't work every single time, but you know, I'm a firm believer that you will find what's a good mix for you if you're willing to try things uh, and learn what, what works for you personally. Because video may not work for you, but it might work just for someone else on your team. Voice might work for you and not work for someone else on the team. Email might work for no, I, you know, it's just a matter of everybody is, is unique in that way. You know, th these are stressful and crazy times and, and sales can be a super stressful career. What are your best tips to manage stress effectively for field salespeople today? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I started doing some work with an organization called uncrushed.org. Uh, and it really began for sellers, you know, that we talk about mental health and we talk about mental well-being and wellness um, in all areas, but rarely do we talk about the stress that sellers have. You know, I, I'm oversimplifying, but businesses sort of do two things. They make stuff, they sell stuff. And if you can't sell anything, the doors close. So it's a big responsibility to bear on the shoulder of if I'm not selling, we're not making revenue. If I'm not making revenue, the doors close and people lose their jobs. And or I'm not putting food on my family's table because I'm in a commission only business or a low base and a higher commission business. And so it's very, very stressful. Uh, and so we went out and sort of asked a lot of questions about, you know, what's important. And, and I would say that, you know, taking the time to invest in yourself, you know, becoming a student of the profession you're in, learn, uh, do things like listen to a podcast or take a class online or, you know, join a community where you have like minded people who can talk about 
ways that they're dealing with things. But the first thing I'd say is you have to be willing to ask for help. Now, if you're on the other end of that request from someone in sales who's asking for help and sounds like they're struggling a little bit, like that is the greatest compliment you could ever get from someone that they trust you enough that they're willing to be just raw and authentic and, you know, sort of as vulnerable as they possibly can to ask for help. And at that moment, you need to just stop and listen and figure out, are they really in crisis and get them help if they are, especially if you work together. Um, but this, you know, for sellers and for everybody, but more importantly, you know, it, 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 for this particular organization, uncrushed.org, check it out. We've got podcasts online and videos online. There's a YouTube channel. There's, you know, all kinds of resources uh, for sellers specifically to go and, and find places that they can go if they, if they need some help. But I would say if you are really feeling overwhelmed, um, tell somebody, tell somebody. And what's the greatest sales lesson that you've learned over the years? Trust the process. <laughs> so no matter how hard you want to will a deal to happen, it doesn't just, it doesn't always happen. Right. And so you have to trust the process. Sometimes deals go forward to go backward, to go forward again, to go way back, to go way forward, to sometimes cancel. You just have to trust the process that ultimately, if you always show up with value, that at some point that same buyer may reach out to you again in the future at another company or when the deal steps back up. Uh, but if you don't trust the process and you try to shoehorn a deal in that shouldn't happen, or to the example I gave a few minutes ago, sell a deal you shouldn't have sold in the first place, it will, it will work to your disadvantage for the rest of your career. I like to think that, you know, people I did business with when I was a seller, that if I got back into selling and I called them tomorrow, that they'd be willing to do business with me again, because I've showed up and I was trustful and, you know, trustworthy and all those things that I did. Sometimes I walked away from deals when I knew that I, I couldn't do it. And so if you trust the process, no matter how frustrating it can be, and sell, salespeople want to win all the time. Statistically, it's not possible. So you just have to uh, sometimes let go. And you know, if you love something, you set it free. If it comes back, it was always yours, right? It's kind of that adage of you got to trust the process. Absolutely. And what would you say, uh, what should all salespeople do every day to become more successful? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replicate what I just said. I think becoming a student of your profession, I can only tell you what I did. When I started selling, I, I accidentally fell into selling uh, software and hardware and services and big digital and technology transformations into the legal industry. And so I subscribed to Law Technology Product News. I read the AmLaw 100 newsletter. I like went to the you know, legal trade shows and I was immersing myself in what was their nomenclature, what were their pain points, what were other people saying? So when I sat in front of lawyers, um, you know, and, and this was nine, so 1995, I was trying to sell you know, digital transformation on how they build clients and how they did time-based billing and all kinds of things, digital, you know, we used to hand bait stamp and then it became you know, all digi digitized, but they were very uncomfortable with that change. But because I could speak their language and understood how to do it, um, it really took me a long way. And I probably had a third of the top 100 law firms in the country because I spent time. I didn't have to be a lawyer. That's not what it was. But it was that I knew the terms that they used and what you know, others were saying. So I read as much as I could um, in that particular industry. So if you sell into a vertical, you know that but just the art of selling, being a student of the behavior, you know, how to do a really good Zoom call, like, how do you do it, you know? And so you have to practice, 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 uh, you know, and, and you will become better. So student is a big word, and of your profession may mean industry, vertical, size company, um, it may mean how you do it, why you do it, um, but if you love your job, uh, which, I, you know, I am blessed, I love my job, I love what I do now, I love what I did then, uh, I think it goes a long way. So if you can make money doing what you love to do, more power to you. And uh, you know, the, the topic today is remote selling through an economic crisis. What, uh, as an actionable takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step to get started on remote selling during an economic crisis successfully? Do it. Like once again, a two word answer this time. For the first one was a one word answer. This one is just do it. Um, 
I asked this question to Seth Godin. If you don't know who Seth is, you can Google him and find out who he is. But I asked this question to Seth many, many years ago. We've been friends for a really long time. And I said, if someone's trying to get into marketing, what, what would you recommend they do? Like early in their career or I'm in another career and I want to get into marketing. He looked me like dead center in the eye. It was a, a, a video webinar we were doing. And he said, do it. Go market for your kids soccer team or for the PTA or for Girl Scout cookies or for, you know, your fishing club or for whatever it might be, just go do it. And so some people who want to get into sales, but no, don't know that it might be something like sell for your favorite charity, right? Trying to get people to donate money. Like that's an act of selling or go work at a small, uh, you know, retail store that now may be online. The, the point is, is you kind of have to do it. And it's practice, 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 practice. And so um, I'd say same thing with selling remotely. For those of you who've been in the field for a really long time, you have to just do it. For those of you who've been inside selling for a really long time, you have an advantage at the moment because you've been doing it for longer than others that have not. And so you should be hands down performing better than others that are having to learn how to do it from an inside perspective versus face to face. All right. Well, Tiffany, I'm going to attempt to summarize for our listeners who are listening to this in the car, um, everything you said today in a, in a minute or two here. So during this time, uh, field salespeople may need to retrain on skills to sell via email or over the phone. It's really important to focus on emotional and uh, emotional intelligence and EQ to sell right now and be really empathetic towards your prospects. Work to understand what businesses value and you can uh, look, what, look to understand what business value you can bring to your prospects. Field salespeople need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable right now. They need to sit in the discomfort. Um, they need to learn how to be remarkable when they're not physically in front of their prospects, which is a new challenge for a lot of us. Think about how you can stand out as a field salesperson when selling remote. Do your research and reach out in creative ways. Make sure the tone and the message that you use in sales calls is adapted to today's market and that you're truly being authentic and genuine. Tiffany believes this is the year of the customer not the prospect, which may be the quote of the day. But um, salespeople need to take time to focus on their existing customers and focus on keeping those customers happy. Then look to your existing customer base to understand which prospects are still a really good fit for you now and look to replicate that with new customers and, and go after those types of prospects going forward in these times. Customers' habits have changed, and many of those changes will be lasting changes, depending on the industry. Start from the customer and work your way back to understand how to be authentic and empathetic with how you sell. Tackle churn in an offensive way, and by that I mean understand what is making customers churn so that you can prevent it from happening in the first place. Also understand what your customers value about your product or service and understand how to engage with them so that you can keep them happy. As a seller, understand what you're selling. Whatever you're doing, what is the job that needs to be done? What is the service that your product or service is, uh, is actually doing? What's the job it's doing? Salespeople can use this advice specifically by listening to their prospects and understanding what their job that they're trying to do for their prospects and, and what their prospects are looking to get done. And then the salespeople can differentiate themselves when pitching a solution to this job on being able to do that particular job that's being needed to be done is uh, how it can be done better, basically. Stevie, that, that was fantastic. Um, where can our listeners read more about your work? Where can they reach out to you? So follow me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm really active uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter both uh, and Instagram. Uh, 
love for you to pick up a copy of Growth IQ. It's a, it's a great book. It's, uh, you know, I wrote it. I wrote the book I would want to read as a seller, sort of short attention span, tell me a story so I can understand, you know, and uh, hopefully that's, that's what the, the book delivered. Um, and, and, you know, outside of that, I'd love to hear feedback on the things that I'm saying because it helps me listen to the, the tone of what's happening and how it's landing on the things I'm talking about. It helps me reshape it. So the next time someone asks me a very similar question, I might change a little bit of what I say because I'm not in the act of selling anymore. I'm not sitting in front of customers in that way. And so I'm sort of out 18 or 24 months. And so I wanna make sure I'm keeping tabs on the pulse of what's happening today. So I'm, I'm always open to hear feedback. Well, that's awesome. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, well, th this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning the skills that Tiffany's taught us today, um, share the love and forward this on to them. Uh, take care until next time, everybody.